Welcome to the Kotke Ride Home for Wednesday, September 7th, 2021. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, what it's actually like getting struck by lightning and the community of survivors helping each other cope. Plus, another team of scientists say they have achieved a crucial and record-breaking milestone in the quest for clean fusion power. And an iconic 1970s band that has spawned countless tribute acts over the years is about to reunite to become their own tribute act, with a little help from Lucasfilm's Industrial Light and Magic. Here are some of the cool things from the news today. Being struck by lightning is a terrifying prospect, and the stuff of legends. Like the case of Roy Sullivan, aka the Spark Ranger, the Shenandoah National Park Ranger who was allegedly struck by lightning a full seven times throughout his life, even fighting off a bear immediately after getting struck the seventh and final time. We marvel at Sullivan's bad luck, but we don't often talk about the physical and psychological effects he endured, including burns, hearing loss, and, it seems, mental health challenges that led to his death in 1983 at the age of 71. There is some doubt about how many times Sullivan really got struck by lightning, since not a single person ever witnessed any of the seven incidents. But he was included in the scrupulous Guinness Book of World Records, beginning with strike number four, and contemporary newspaper articles do cross-check his injuries with a doctor's notes. Skepticism is something familiar to lightning strike survivors. Even for those who had witnesses to them being struck, the symptoms that persist for years later are often met with doubt and resistance by family, friends, and even medical providers. James Walker at Narratively recently profiled a woman named Shauna Williams-Turner and her journey after being struck by lightning, including the community of survivors that she found who are helping each other cope and find solutions. But first, let's dig a bit more into lightning and what happens when it strikes. The Washington Post, in a 2013 article about Roy Sullivan, refers to lightning strikes as a gigantic floating battery and text messages from Mother Nature. They're, quote, fast, furious, and frequent reminders of who's boss. The typical bolt lasts less than half a second. It's one to six inches in diameter, spans nearly five miles, and can pack a punch of a hundred million volts. Earth gets peppered billions of times a year, with lightning killing an estimated 24,000 people annually, end quote. Though it is important to note that about 90% of lightning never touches down on Earth, staying up in the clouds. And from Walker's narratively piece, quote, Lightning is born when humid air is pushed high into the atmosphere during a storm, leading the water vapor inside a cloud to freeze into tiny particles of ice. The ice particles collide with each other, generating a strong negative charge at the base of the cloud that's attracted to the positive charge of the ground below. When the negative charge is strong enough to overpower the insulating properties of the air, it explodes as lightning. As a bolt shoots down toward the ground, it heats the air around it to about 50,000 degrees. Degrees Fahrenheit, four times hotter than the surface of the sun, causing a shock wave heard as thunder. When lightning hits a person, it sends 300 million volts of electricity across the body in three milliseconds. The current flows externally, disrupting or short-circuiting the body's electrical systems, such as the one that controls the heart. Cardiac arrest is the most common cause of death from a lightning strike. Brain damage from blunt force trauma caused by the shockwave is also common. The jolt can severely burn skin, and in some cases it etches an intricate web of scars on the body that resembles the form of a lightning bolt itself, known as Lichtenberg figures, which fade within days for reasons unknown. Most people survive because the lightning hits the ground nearby or passes through a taller object, such as a tree." End quote. For Shauna Williams-Turner, it was a transformer. Six years ago, the special ed teacher was supervising a high school soccer game as a storm began. Taking cover from the rain in a ticket booth at one point, she leaned against the metal door, and when a lightning bolt hit a nearby transformer, Shauna felt, quote, excruciating pain, as if her shoulders had been reduced to burning jelly, end quote. Her arm felt like it was burning, her feet tingled, her chest hurt, and she was increasingly disoriented. Eventually, her family got her to a hospital, but after one night of observation, some tests, and no signs of obvious injury, she was released. 
As the weeks went on, though, her symptoms got worse. There were the muscle aches and the ringing in her ears, as well as sleep apnea, fatigue, and struggles with her short-term memory. She experienced anxiety around crowds, flashes of light, and especially thunderstorms. Working and being there for her family became more and more difficult. At first, she was receiving workers' compensation, but about a year in, the insurance company made her undergo a four-hour-long independent medical examination and then determined that her symptoms were simply the result of stress, not injury, so she'd no longer receive financial support through workers' comp. Through the tribulations, her seven-year relationship fell apart, friends fell to the wayside, and her car was repossessed. Eventually, she was alerted to a support group called Lightning Strike and Electric Shock Survivors International, and an annual conference they were holding just a three hours drive from where Shauna lived in Fayetteville, North Carolina. The group was founded in 1989 by Steve Marshburn, a lightning strike survivor himself, who after encountering the lack of research on survivors' injuries, began documenting his symptoms and soon realized that his lined up with those of an acquaintance who had been electrocuted, hence the combining of the two in the support group. The connection between lightning strikes and electric shocks goes back in some ways, of course, to Benjamin Franklin and his kite-flying experiment. The Washington Post points out that that experiment didn't just change the course of electrical technology, it also changed how the public viewed lightning. Prior to that point, it was more often associated with myth and faith. John Friedman, who wrote the book Out of the Blue, A History of Lightning, which sounds like exactly the kind of book I'd like to read, calls this theological meteorology. The term is actually a quote from historian Andrew Dixon White, who points to Franklin's kite experiment as the moment that lightning started to be viewed as a natural phenomenon and not a divinely inspired one or a symbol from a wrathful god. Still, the imagery of lightning as relating to higher powers, or at least evocative of ancient myths, persists, even or especially among lightning strike survivors. Narratively points out how one attendee at the Lightning Strike and Electric Shock Survivors International Conference called himself Thor on his name tag, how Shauna has since gotten two lightning bolt tattoos, and how one survivor's friends think he may have seen the Archangel Michael while he was unconscious following his own lightning strike. Symbols, stories, and faith have always been around to step in when reality is too overwhelming or unexplainable. We may be able to outline the science behind lightning nowadays, for the most part, but as evidenced by Shauna and others' stories, we still know regrettably little about the long-term side effects of being struck by lightning, and so survivors turn to whatever they can to cope. Sometimes that's faith and story. Sometimes it's community, like this support group. Having attended conferences for people who were part of a specialty group before, I know a little about just how powerful they can be for anyone with a rare condition or experience. To meet other people who have been through similar challenges, to hear from somebody else who had the same undocumented reaction to a medication as you, or who successfully got insurance to cover some treatment you've been denied coverage for, to talk to people who've been living with this for decades longer than you and learn what their life has been like. This stuff is huge. It can help you feel less alone, validated in your experiences, and like there are paths forward. The practical tips are incredible, of course, but that sense of community is vital for mental health. It seems especially so for lightning strike and electric shock survivors. Quoting narratively, the group conducted a survey in 2017 of 595 of its lightning strike members and found that 280 of them suffered from depression and 67 were suicidal. Steve Marshburn, the founder, has personally talked 27 people out of suicide, end quote. And groups like this are also important for advocacy. At the conference covered in the article, members and their partners were selling books and academic papers with the latest research. And with people coming together, it becomes more feasible to push for research and funding to fill the gaps in current medical knowledge about treatment. And this one in particular is tough because the symptoms can vary so widely. Take this rundown of the group's members and their symptoms circa 2013 from the Washington Post. Quote, Cheryl, hit while phoning her husband to warn him about a storm, petite mal seizures. Mike, hit while golfing, completely paralyzed but slowly recovering. Rachel, hit once indoors, once outdoors, no lasting effects. Geneva, hit once indoors, once outdoors, headaches, chronic pain, digestive problems, fatigue, sensitivity to barometric pressure. 
Angela hit three times severe neuropathy, chronic pain, digestive problems, aphasia, apraxia, frontal lobe damage, short-term memory loss, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Then there are the Twilight Zone cases, such as Nina Lazzaroni, an Ohio woman who turned into a walking circuit breaker after being struck in 1995. Lights inexplicably flick off when she passes street lamps, billboards, and parking lots. End quote. Despite the wide variance and existing mysteries, we do need to keep working to learn more about the symptoms experienced by lightning strike and electric shock survivors and how to treat those symptoms, physical and psychological. There's an even bigger takeaway from this example of a rare experience, though, and it's summed up in the conclusion of that old Washington Post profile of Roy Sullivan, reflecting on the many mysteries of his life. Quote, Researchers marvel at the complexity of lightning storms. They've learned a lot, but are still puzzled by the physics of how air ionizes and reconfigures or exactly how a strike affects the body's chemistry. Yet nature at its spectacular, mysterious best is no match for what goes on daily inside a person's head and heart. How much do we know about the storm clouds and blue skies within any of us? End quote. So last month on the August 18th episode of this show, I discussed a recent advancement made towards achieving sustained nuclear fusion by scientists at the National Ignition Facility in California. They were able to break a record for energy output, producing 1.3 megajoules of energy for just a brief moment. Really brief, like a hundred trillionths of a second. It was viewed as something of a proof of concept for achieving ignition, a crucial tipping point at which the fusion reaction will make more energy than it uses, and was hailed as the most significant step forward in nuclear fusion since 1972. Now, another big advancement has been made by another team, and it's getting similarly lofty language applied to it. Now, not being an expert in nuclear fusion by any means, it's tough for me to tell how much of this is the kind of exaggerated excitement you get when you are laser-focused on a task, and how much of it is actually a huge deal in the grand scheme of things. Some quick context on nuclear fusion, quoting the Boston Globe. Like today's nuclear fission plants, fusion plants could generate electricity without emitting planet-warming carbon. But fusion reactors would also produce hardly any radioactive waste, would pose no risk of meltdowns, and could be switched on and off as needed. And fusion runs on deuterium, an isotope of hydrogen that is readily obtained from seawater, meaning there could be a practically unlimited fuel supply. Fusion is the same energy source that powers the sun and hydrogen bombs. Scientists have spent decades seeking a way to unleash this power while keeping it under control. The most common approach, called a tokamak, was first conceived by scientists in the Soviet Union. A tokamak is a giant, donut-shaped electromagnet that generates a field so strong that fusion reactions can safely take place inside the field. Tokamaks have achieved successful fusion reactions, but they use more power than they generate, and the machines are immensely expensive. For instance, an international consortium is spending $25 billion to construct the biggest tokamak ever. Under construction in France, it's not expected to switch on until 2025. End quote. But scientists at MIT, in partnership with a team from the startup Commonwealth Fusion Systems, made a huge breakthrough last week that could move up the timeline for commercially available fusion power plants by decades. Quoting MIT News, On September 5th, for the first time, a large, high-temperature superconducting electromagnet was ramped up to a field strength of 20 Tesla, the most powerful magnetic field of its kind ever created on Earth. That successful demonstration helps resolve the greatest uncertainty in the quest to build the world's first fusion power plant that can produce more power than it consumes. Developing the new magnet is seen as the greatest technological hurdle to making that happen. Its successful operation now opens the door to demonstrating fusion in a lab on Earth, which has been pursued for decades with limited progress. With the magnet technology now successfully demonstrated, the MIT CFS collaboration is on track to build the world's first fusion device that can create and confine a plasma that produces more energy than it consumes. That demonstration device, called Spark, is targeted for completion in 2025. End quote. 2025. That's when the tokamak in France was just going to turn on. The MIT CFS team thinks they'll have completed the first test plant that can achieve sustained fusion by then. The team is definitely optimistic, though they're honest about that optimism. 
Robert Mumgard, the CEO and co-founder of Commonwealth Fusion Systems, prompts viewers of the video announcement of the achievement to imagine 10,000 fusion power plants by 2050, producing 20% of the global energy use without emitting any carbon. I mean, hey, maybe we'll get there. For what it's worth, Maria Zuber, vice president for research at MIT, said that it was this demonstration of the magnets that made her really believe that this would work. But there's still so many more hurdles to cross. I'll repeat a quote I shared on August 18th from Omar Hurricane, chief scientist for the Inertial Confinement Fusion Program who achieved the record-breaking energy output last month, quote, I'm very concerned in general about fusion being hyped as a solution for climate change. My personal opinion is that fusion energy is still a future technology, so it would be foolish for people to bet the planet on fusion addressing the immediate climate concerns, end quote. Basically, it's amazing if it'll work, especially on the shortened timeline MIT and CFS think could now happen, but it can't be the only solution. Even in Mumgard's optimistic vision of the future, he only put 20% of global energy use as coming from fusion, not all of it. And 2050 is a long ways away in terms of how rapidly consequences of the climate emergency are compounding. If fusion power plants ever actually become a thing, they will not and cannot be the only solution. All right, so real quick here, because I know I spent forever talking about lightning, but I am so delighted to tell you, if you have not heard already, because apparently this was hyped up big time in England, ABBA is reuniting. The Swedish pop group, most famous for, depending on your demographic, being the first ever winners of Eurovision, the band behind the musical Mamma Mia, one of the most commercially successful musical acts of all time, or the source of music for the A-teens, have announced they will be releasing their first new studio album in 40 years. That is not all, though. In addition to the 10-track album, two songs of which have already been released online, the band will be performing a virtual concert next May at a specially built arena in London. And, and, this isn't a virtual concert like audience members sit at home and watch performers who are live in the same space together. Oh no, it's the opposite. Audience members will go to the physical 3,000-seat capacity ABBA Arena that is being erected in London's Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, and they will be watching digital versions of the band members, depicting them as their younger selves. They're calling them avatars because their branding is impeccable, and they were designed by the best in the biz, Industrial Light and Magic, the VFX arm of Lucasfilm. The foursome, Agnetha, Frida, Benny, and Bjorn, have already performed the entire show while wearing motion capture suits in front of 160 cameras over a period of five weeks. When the avatars take to the stage this coming spring, they'll be accompanied by a live band. General sales of tickets began yesterday, and I don't think they're technically sold out, but might as well be. British Twitter kind of exploded with people attempting to buy tickets yesterday. But no worries, even if you can't go see the avatars at ABBA Arena, the new album, ABBA Voyage, will be dropping on November 5th. Link in the show notes if you want to listen to the two released tracks, I Still Have Faith in You and Don't Shut Me Down. Benny Anderson gave this glowing review, quote, I think it's pretty good. We've done as good as we could at our age. End quote. All right, that is it from me for today. As always, this show was produced by Ride Home Media and Kotki.org. I am Jackson Bird, and I will talk to you again tomorrow.